so happy to see all of you this morning. Um, you notice the screens are working pretty well today? Um, by God's grace, we improved our projection system, and uh, you can see the screen very well. I'm really thankful to Pastor Steve and Tim. They were up until 2.30 a.m. this morning trying to install these projectors. So we have, a, we have a special use for them in today's message, and I'm so thankful that uh, they're working well. The title of my message is, See, Your King Comes to You. Wow, it's a beautiful title. May we say it all together, please? See, your king comes to you. Let's pray. Father, you're so merciful and kind and gracious. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for the salvation you've given us in Jesus. And the great privilege we have to listen to you, have fellowship with you, and serve you. Father, we need to hear your word. Please speak into our hearts. Please help us to hear your divine voice and meet each one of us very personally today and bless this message. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> our key verse today is verse 5. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. May we read this verse together, please? Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Today we begin a new section of Matthew's Gospel, chapters 21 through 28. And these chapters cover Jesus' Passion Week. It starts when Jesus enters Jerusalem as king. And after his entry, he tells many parables and gives many great teachings. And through these he reveals what kind of king he is and how his kingdom would come. Then he suffered and died for our sins and defeated the power of death through his resurrection. And in this way, he became our savior king. Today's passage is Jesus' triumphal entry. Jesus deliberately demonstrated that he came as the king sent by God. When you hear the word king, how do you feel? Some people are nervous and anxious. Oh no, a king. He's going to violate my human rights and oppress me and make me clean my room. But Jesus is not that kind of king at all. Jesus is the savior king. He never forces anyone to submit to him. But he embraces all who accept him as king and saves us. It's very important to ask, who is the king of my life? Is Jesus your king? Or does another king sit on the throne of your heart? The king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. Or the king of the court, LeBron James. Or the king of cotton, King Cotton. Uh, greed and money. Many kinds of kings. 
who's ruling in our hearts? When we honestly examine ourselves, many times we find we are our own king. But you know, we're terrible kings of our own lives. We just mess everything up. We really need our Savior King Jesus to rule over us. Let's learn what kind of king Jesus is and accept him in our hearts today. First, Jesus is a gentle and humble king. What kind of king? Wow, that's beautiful. Jesus had repeatedly told his disciples they were going up to Jerusalem and he would suffer and die and rise again. According to prophecy, repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in Jesus' name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. It all takes place in Jerusalem. And now Jesus has come to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, about five miles from the city. Jesus prepared to enter by sending two disciples with these instructions. Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say to them, the Lord needs them. And they will send them right away. Wow, this teaching shows Jesus' omniscience. He knows everything. And his lordship. Jesus owns everything. Jesus is the creator God. John 1.3 says, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Do you believe this? Then all things belong to Jesus. Everything belongs to Jesus. Amen? Amen. And we are just stewards of what he has given us. So when he wants to use something that we have, we should say, yes, sir. Here it is, sir. And indeed, it's a great privilege when Jesus uses anything in our lives. Are you ready to offer to Jesus what is his? In your family, in your personal life. As we prepare the International Summer Bible Conference, uh, my wife and I decided to host coworkers from Latin America in our home uh, because she speaks Spanish. I speak English. <laughs> so we talked about it in our uh, family and where, where people can stay and what kind of arrangements to make. And we asked my youngest son, Joshua, age 11, if he can give up his room for a few days. And he became very serious. <laughs> and he thought about all of his stuffed animals, well arranged in his uh, room, which have great value to him because most of them I gave him after traveling on a long journey somewhere. So he's in a crisis, conflict. I believe it's time for us to learn the Lordship of Christ. Move the stuffed animals for a few days. Give the room to someone else. Amen. Uh, you agree? Okay, please tell him. Also, <laughs> it's a good chance to learn Jesus' lordship. 
Everything belongs to him, right? Amen. Jesus' entry would have deep meaning. Look at verses 4 and 5. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you. Gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Do you know where this quotation is from in the Bible? Does anyone know? Yeah, Dr. Sarah said, Zechariah. And you know when Zechariah lived? Anybody know? Bible scholar? Uh, nobody knows. We have to study Zechariah sometime. Around 500 years before Jesus, right? So 500 years before Jesus, Zechariah gave this prophecy. And it has to do with the king who was coming, promised by God. When we see Matthew's gospel, there's a theme of Jesus' kingship. Remember in chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus Christ? What did that emphasize? His kingship, according to his genealogy. Did you notice how many times fulfilled is repeated in Matthew's gospel? Did anyone count? Come on, you've been studying Matthew's gospel, right? No one counted? No one counted. Oh, gosh. We have to study Matthew all over again. I counted 14 specific times that prophecy was fulfilled by Jesus, which had to do with his kingship. Matthew is saying to us very clearly, Jesus is the king. And his kingship is authentic, legitimate, recognized by God. So if anyone opposes Jesus, they're opposing God. When we see the contents of this prophecy, we're amazed at the nature of his kingship. His kingship is essentially spiritual and different than that of worldly kings. He came to save his people from their sins. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He rules as a shepherd who nurtures, protects, guides, and helps his people. He fought against and defeated our enemy, the devil, and his temptations. And he gives us victory over him. Amen. And he has authority to forgive sins and cleanse all the guilt feelings from our hearts. He has power to heal the sick, drive out demons, even raise the dead. He's so powerful, but he's also so gentle and so humble. He gives us true rest in our hearts. According to Matthew 12, 20, he does not break a bruised reed or snuff out a smoldering wick. All kinds of weak people can come to Jesus and he doesn't hurt, but heals and empowers and restores. He is full of compassion, especially for the weak and marginalized. There are so many beautiful aspects of Jesus' kingship. We cannot talk about all of them. It was about this king that the prophet said, 
See, your king comes to you. See is from the Greek word idu. It means look, pay attention, listen. In this world, there are so many things that try to steal our hearts and take away our joy and peace and spirit. Sometimes we're just distracted by petty pleasures or unnecessary things. Even looking at the cell phone, Facebook, during worship service, that's a big mistake. Sometimes we're tired and weary and we lose our focus on Jesus. And sometimes practical problems arise that we must deal with urgently and desperately. Yet, even in those moments, we need to see Jesus. Pay attention to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Fix our eyes on Jesus. And hold on to Jesus as a matter of first importance. And to do this, we need faith. For example, when the Israelites grew impatient in the wilderness, they spoke against God and Moses. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes who bit them. I don't know if they bit them on the lips, complaining lips. Anyway, they bit them. Some people died. Others came back to their senses. And they asked for God's mercy. And the Lord instructed Moses to make a bronze snake and put it on a pole, promising that anyone who was bitten could look up at the bronze snake and live. It seemed to be a strange solution. It was hard to accept. It was not easy to turn away from the desperate reality, and look up. It was unreasonable. They really needed to trust God and his promise. Referring to this event, Jesus said in John 3, 14 and 15, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Humanly speaking, to look at the cross seems strange. How can this help anyone? But all who have trusted in him have received eternal life. And this life is not just something we need in the future. It's the beginning of a new, vibrant, dynamic life. Here and now. Wow. It's full of wisdom and power. We can overcome challenges and live victoriously. All we need to do to experience this amazing life is to see Jesus and accept him as our king. See, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Most kings enter their capital city with great pomp and ceremony, but our king, Jesus, is so humble. He comes to us riding on a donkey's colt, maybe uh, riding a moped, a moped down the street. He's so humble, approachable. Anyone can go to him. 
You know, most kings sit on their thrones and wait for their subjects to come to them. And without an appointment, there's no chance to meet them. But our King Jesus comes to us humbly. He stands at the door of our hearts. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. You know, in verse 5, the pronouns your and you are singular. They're personal. Jesus wants to be the king of each one of us personally. And we have to make a personal decision to receive him in our hearts. Let's look up at Jesus. Let's accept Jesus as our king very personally. See Your king comes to you. As we begin this new year of 2018, I felt that I am personally at a crossroads. I will turn 60 in August. I know it's shocking. (laughs) I look 42, but (laughs) my birth certificate says 1958, so... I feel like I can do many things, and I want to do many things, but reality is reality. Um, My wife noticed that I began to forget things, which I never, ever did in the past. She always forgot things. I always remembered everything. Now I'm forgetting something. I'm not sure how the Lord will guide me, Also, the ISBC 2018 is coming. And there are hardships. There are challenges. My family members need my personal prayer and care. And I'm concerned deeply about the spiritual lives of many growing leaders. Honestly, I often wake up in the middle of the night with an urgent need to pray. Yet at this moment, I hear Jesus' words. See, your king comes to you. Jesus has come to rule and reign in my heart. Amen. All I really need to do is look up and accept him as king every day. Jesus' preparation to enter Jerusalem was very meaningful as we thought about. But to his disciples, the instruction to go get a donkey and a colt might have sounded strange. How does he know where the donkey and colt are? Why does he need them at this moment? Go tell us to get a sword or something else. Will the owner really give them to him? They could have thought many things. Usually, we don't obey what we don't understand. But the disciples went and did what Jesus instructed them to do. How could they do that? They trusted Jesus. They simply trusted Jesus. They brought the donkey and the colt. Jesus really wanted the donkey, but uh, the colt, but it's hard to take the colt from the mother. So both, he, he brought both, colt and mother. And they placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Wow, he began going into the city. And it became a really big event. A very large crowd gathered. And as they realized Who was coming? They spread their cloaks on the road. 
Some cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. In our time, we would roll out the red carpet. But they had no red carpet. So they used branches and their own cloaks. It was a very personal expression of reverence and honor to Jesus. Soon, sounds of praise began to rise. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Wow, they welcomed Jesus as the king sent by God. They were so joyful and so full of praise from a willing heart. When we see Jesus and accept him as our king, we're filled with joy, thanksgiving, and praise. When Jesus' disciples followed and praised him with all their hearts, the whole city was stirred. People asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Here we learn that when we praise and worship Jesus in public, many people are drawn to Jesus. For example, in the Christmas season of 2010, a gifted and carefully arranged chorus sang Hallelujah by Handel in a shopping mall food court. Many people joined them until the whole shopping mall became like a worship service. Later, more than 51 million people viewed the event on YouTube. And even non-Christians were moved to tears. We want to show you uh, briefly a segment of this. more. like to do that? <laughs> Shepherd Tim, uh, get volunteers. <laughs> Second, Jesus is a righteous and merciful king. What was first? Uh, I'm sorry, if I confused you, I'm sorry. What was first? Gentle and humble king. 
So what was first? Thank you. Now what is second? Yes. We find these in the next event. Jesus, upon arrival into Jerusalem, first went to the temple courts. The temple courts was the place set apart for women and Gentiles to come and pray. Jesus arrived there, indicating he came to save people of all people. But what he found was buying and selling going on. Zeal for God's house consumed Jesus. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. He said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Wow. Strong words. God established the temple as a place for people to meet him, listen to him, receive forgiveness, and pray. And through fellowship with God, our souls revive. And we find grace and strength and wisdom to serve others. But the religious leaders had turned the temple into a business. Buying and selling. To make money. Choking the spiritual life of the nation Israel. They were powerful people. Nobody dared approach these people. But Jesus boldly confronted them with strength and truth. He's not only gentle and humble. He's a righteous king. And we can learn that our church should be a place that honors God. Honors God and make a good spiritual environment for people to receive his blessing. When the spiritual atmosphere in the temple was restored, many blind and lame people came to Jesus there. Jesus welcomed them and healed them one by one. Wow. Jesus is so merciful to those in need. Mercy is an important attribute of the Messiah, which Matthew emphasizes. In 913, Jesus told the legalistic Pharisees, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus wants us to be merciful. Wow, the temple was so changed. All kinds of little children and healed people were in the temple praising Jesus. Everybody was happy and rejoicing, except one group of people, the chief priests and teachers of the law. They became very indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? <sighs> wow. They're really grumpy guys. They thought it was blasphemy. They thought Jesus doesn't deserve that praise. But what did Jesus say? Yes. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? He proclaimed, he is the Lord. He's worthy of that worship. And he defended those who needed mercy. Then he left there and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. 
Third, King Jesus works through our faith and prayer. Early the next morning, Jesus went from Bethany back to Jerusalem. It was about two miles. Jesus had not eaten breakfast. Uh, he was hungry. And he saw a fig tree by the road, and he went up to it and found nothing on it except leaves. And he said, may you never bear fruit again. And the tree withered. Did Jesus do that just because he was hungry? Or hangry, as they say? <laughs> no, there's a deeper meaning to this event. Jesus saw the fig tree as a symbol of the nation Israel. Though they had the trappings of religious life, he did not find the fruit he was looking for. The religious leaders were proud, greedy, legalistic, merciless, and hard-hearted. As a result, the temple became like a den of robbers, and the whole nation was badly influenced. This provoked God's judgment, which came in A.D. 70. Jerusalem was destroyed, and Israel scattered. Here we must acknowledge that God judges nations and people. God judges based on their fruit. What kind of fruit does God want us to bear? Micah 6.8 says, What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is a poetic expression of the character of Christ that God wants to develop in each person. He wants each one of us to grow in Jesus' likeness. The disciples were amazed at Jesus' work. They asked, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? Wow! That's amazing. Jesus, wow. What did, what did he tell them? Truly, I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to this fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. It's amazing. Jesus wants to empower his disciples to do great things for God, even moving mountains. This power comes through faith in God. It's not something that human beings can control. It comes from God through prayer, which is based on his will. God's power can move mountains. God's power can move mountains. And this is what the disciples needed. They faced the mountains of the Jewish establishment which would be a great enemy of the gospel. Jesus' disciples looked powerless, like little ants. But as we see in the book of Acts, when the disciples were devoted to prayer, the Holy Spirit came on them. When the Holy Spirit came, they became powerful witnesses of Christ. They stood before the religious leaders and rebuked them to repent boldly and courageously. Later they went to Judea and Samaria and they moved the mountain of prejudice in those places. And they went to the whole world and eventually the Roman Empire was overcome by the power of faith in Jesus' people. This encourages us. We face mountains, 
anti-Christian bias, many kinds of obstacles and hindrances in our ministries, in our own personal lives, as we seek to grow in Jesus' character. These are powers that we cannot move by our effort or will or determination. But God can move mountains. When we trust in him and pray, God can move the mountain, whatever it is that we face. But we must pray, not just think about the mountain all the time. We have to ask God to move the mountain. How often do you pray for God to move the mountain that you're confronting instead of just thinking about the mountain all the time? Let's remember this promise as we confront obstacles and as we prepare the International Summer Bible Conference this year. And let's remember this promise as we seek to grow in the likeness of our King Jesus. As Jesus is gentle and humble, he wants us to be gentle and humble. As Jesus is righteous, he wants us to grow in righteousness. As Jesus is merciful, he wants us to grow in mercy. And when we pray, trusting in God Almighty, all kinds of obstacles will move, we can grow in Jesus' likeness and bear much fruit for his glory. See, your king comes to you. Let's see Jesus and accept him in our hearts today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the wonderful grace of Jesus who came so humbly and so gently, but with such great power to move the mountains of sin and death, to move all obstacles, and to restore your glorious reign and your great kingdom. Father, please help each one of us look up at you and see you today. Please come into our hearts, reign over us, make us more like you, and give us power to do your work. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen.